pray. I pray for understanding and I pray for the words because God knows who's going to be here and what they need to hear. I don't. I'm not that smart. So when I'm done praying, I read through the lessons. Now we follow what's called a lectionary, which is a selection of readings set up in the ancient church. Um, we use a three-year version of that, so all the readings are placed out for us for three years. So I read through the ones for the week, and of course several themes will surface as I'm reading through them, but many times a story will pop into my head, a personal story, and many times it was a story that I had long forgotten. And when that happens, I usually take that theme and then I write the sermon on it. As many of you heard last week, my wife and I several years ago owned a deli, but several years before that, we owned a bar and grill. Keep in mind, this was long before I was called into the ministry. It was in a small town, and sometimes we had some rough characters walk through our door. And one evening, we only had a few customers in the place, and one of those gentlemen walked in. And he was less than friendly and not very cooperative. So with a bit of animation and, and a little more volume in my voice, I requested that he leave. And to my surprise, he complied. And I turned to a friend of mine, Tom, who was this, this big old Harley guy, and, and I said, wow, that could have gone either way. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry. I was watching you the whole time. I got your back. That's the story that popped into my head as I was reading the lessons, believe it or not, a story I had forgotten about. But you see, our Lord is really constantly telling, this, telling us this all the time, isn't he? He says to his children, don't worry, I'm watching over you all of the time. I've got your back. And he does. He shows this truth throughout Scripture. And our readings for today show us a few examples of this. Now, in our Old Testament reading, we find Moses in a familiar situation, don't we? The Israelites are still wandering through the wilderness, and they're complaining. The Lord has blessed them with manna, literally bread from heaven, so they don't have to go out and find their own food. But they get to the point where they aren't happy anymore. And they complain to Moses that they would rather go back to Egypt, back into slavery, than to eat any more manna. Their thought was, at, at least as slaves, we got meat to eat. Now, if you were or are the parent of multiple children, little children, if you've ever been in charge of multiple little children, if you've ever been in a room with multiple little children, or if you've ever been in a board meeting, you know that complaining is contagious. One person complains about something and then other people join in, and then more join in until the whole room is complaining. Most of those people never had any intention to complain until that can of worms was opened by that first person. Understand that Moses was leading upwards of a million people through the wilderness, and they start complaining. Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. Well, because they were slaves. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Well, Moses is at his wit's end. He can't handle it anymore, and he turns to the Lord, frustrated and desperate, and God hears him. I've been watching. I've got your back. Gather 70 men together. So Moses does, and God blesses them and they handle the situation. They help Moses. You see, God watches over us and hears us when we call out to him. But understand, he knows the difference between when we think we can't take it anymore and when we really can't take it anymore. He knows when there are still lessons to learn and when it's time to step in. The key for us is to stay focused on him, keep calling on him. In other words, keep praying. And notice how God helps. Many times, he uses other people to help. In our lesson from James today, we find the same theme, prayer and helping each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. That sounds like a congregation, doesn't it? We come together and pray. We have a prayer list, as I just announced in our bulletin, of, of the names of people, of loved ones of this congregation that we ask you to pray for. So please use it. Our Lord has given us a community of fellow saints to hear our confession, to hear our needs, and pray for one another. And he also calls us to watch out for one another. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. God has our back through the services of our own brothers and sisters. That is what a congregation is. That is what the Christian church is. God did not create his church for entertainment purposes. He brought us together to stay together as brothers and sisters like a family in good times and in challenging times. God could just wave his hand and fix things if he wanted to, and sometimes he does. But he also works through his children, you and me, to serve one another. God knows about the incredible blessings we receive when we serve one another, when, when we step up and do the work. If you have ever helped someone in great need, whether it was physical or emotional or spiritual, you understand why God works through us. You know what a blessing it is to help another human being. And when we serve others, we serve him. What a beautiful circle that is. Jesus himself spells this out in Matthew 25 when he's telling his disciples about who will be saved. He talks about a living faith, the heavenly reward for the truly faithful. Jesus says, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick? or in prison and visit you. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Faith itself we receive as a gift from the Holy Spirit through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through faith, but we live it out through, his, through worshiping our Lord, through turning to him, through receiving his gifts, and through serving him by serving one another as his body, the church. The church being all true believers in Christ and his saving works. And that brings us to our gospel lesson from Mark 9. And John said to him, he's talking to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, but he was not following us because he was not following us. John was concerned because another group was serving the Lord, but they weren't part of the group. And that would be like us pointing our finger at Shepherd of the Hill and criticizing them for their prison ministry, or looking across the lake and criticizing them for their family promise ministry. That attitude divides the church, and that makes Satan happy. True, we may have some theological differences, but there are so many things we agree on, so many ways we can serve the Lord in his name. And by serving in his name, we also not only help them physically, but we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, don't stop them, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Again, God watches over us by calling us to serve one another in his name. People turn to him in prayer, and then he calls us as Christians to serve those people, including telling them about Jesus. And why? Because salvation is the number one goal. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Anything that leads a person away from salvation is from the devil. It's really that simple. Nothing is more important than Jesus' work on the cross. God sent his son to save the world. The only reason you and I are on this earth is to share that good news. Believe it or not, we are here for no other reason than to grow the kingdom of God. If that weren't true, he would have called it quits long ago. But God is patient, and he wants us to reach out to everyone. And Jesus makes the importance of, importance of this perfectly clear in the last part of our gospel lesson. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And then Jesus goes into some very graphic language, illustrating that nothing is worth losing your salvation over. Let nothing come between you and your Savior. Repent and be saved. The gift of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing. Now the last few words of our gospel lesson are also important. It says, be at peace with one another. As Christians never lose sight of the real enemy, the devil is trying constantly to pull us apart because he knows there is weakness in separation and division. If he can divide the church, if he can break the family unit apart, if he can corrupt a government, if he can divide a nation, he has a victory. Stand firm and don't let that happen. Remember that God watches over you at all times. He's got your back. How? Quite simply, repent, receive, and revive. Repent. Turn to the Lord for forgiveness. This is why Jesus died and rose again, to grant you that forgiveness, to rescue you from the slavery of sin. Receive. Receive the gifts that God has for you. Come together as a congregation, as his church, as his body, and receive the gifts of his word and sacrament, and be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, ready for battle. Revive. Go out and spread the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing revives a lost soul other than the God-given faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Jesus himself tells us in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nothing else saves us. Nothing else is more important. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 150.